Can we go? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to the second day of DEF CONF. Uh, just a gentle reminder for the rest of the day, if you come into a, spe uh, like a, a, a conference room, please close the doors gently so that not to distract uh, the, the speaker. And please do go and rate and uh, comment on, the, uh, on our website about the, the speeches. And so, Let's start today with our first, uh, our first speaker, Daniel Rieck, and he'll tell us some interesting stuff. Let's welcome him. Thank you. Thanks for getting up so early. Uh, I'm relieved that I have the grayest beard in the room. Uh, first question, who in the room knows what this background picture is taken from? No one. OK. Uh, I only had one presentation where people knew the movie. Uh, that was with uh, it was some DNS guy at a very sign. Um, yeah. it, it's from uh, Dark Star. Probably the best movie ever made. So yeah. All right. Um, I'll be talking. I have to warn you, um, I had a brilliant idea to redo all my slides yesterday. So uh, yeah, we'll see if that works. Um, you know, they are not, not all really new. I picked them from a bunch of, but I changed the whole story. So it means I probably have to 
uh, talk very fast at a point because I run out of time and have some logical breaks because it really sounded great at 3 a.m. this night. Um, so, you know, bear with me. Uh, you can leave the feedback on the website then and tell me what you think. So, um, Greybeard. A Greybeard thinks he's really wise. They hate systemd and they fork distributions. If they haven't forked Debian over systemd yet, I'll probably get them to fork again whenever Debian starts believing what I say, which isn't my first concern because I work at Red Hat, so who cares? Let's go and take a philosophical view on what is the role of the Linux operating system. Right? Um, whenever like, people at Red Hat draw an abstract vision of our stack, right now they put Linux in infrastructure. And there's some logic to it. You know, it's kind of, it, it, it has all the device drivers and stuff. It, it sure like, feels like infrastructure. But you can take an alternative view. And if you, if you look at it from an application point of view, you realize the core function of Linux is not to make hardware work or provide infrastructure. The core function is to provide a user space runtime. Because the only point for running IT is really to run something on it, right? Not to run the hardware for its whole purpose. So, you know, really the core function of Linux is to provide an application runtime. You know, the application might be infrastructure management, in which case it runs in the infrastructure. But, you know, it, most of what we do is actually in the user space. And most of our users are people um, who really care about the running applications on top. And if you take a historic view, you know, where, where did we come from? Why are we doing things the way we are doing? You know, and, and this is like, you know, very, very long ago uh, when this started. You know, early on, the mainframe model was basically a completely proprietary integrated experience. You know, the, the vendor controlled what software you could run. The machines usually were leased, and you didn't own the hardware if you had it. Um, and that got replaced by what then was called open systems, Unix. Um, in the PC world, Windows wasn't server yet, and I'm going to leave net netware out. But um, open systems came along, Unix came along, and there you had a vertically integrated hardware to operating system stack and an, a, a vendor controlled tool chain, but you started to see an open ecosystem on the ISV side. You could run your own software easily, you could buy software from a third party. The problem there still was the vertical integration. If you see it in the history of Unix, they you know, had all these standards that didn't mean anything in reality because it didn't actually provide compatibility you know, on a binary level. You were totally, um, they, they had all the open, open labels and then you were totally locked into one vendor's ecosystem whenever you decided to go with that ven vendor. Um, there was some level of source code compatibility, but you know, if, if you ever wonder, like, how, how a behemoth like Autoconf was created and why, you know, look at, at what they had to deal with to make this work across all these different versions. And I know we are like getting there too with Linux, um, you know, it's getting hard to keep things compatible, but uh, for very different reasons because we're moving faster, not because we have proprietary differentiation on the technology level, right? And then when PC hardware got good enough and people, you know, started wanting to use PC hardware, um, and you had multiple hardware vendors, and it was the need to break up this, this vertical integration. And that's the role of Linux. Linux provided the neutral run, user space runtime across different hardware options. That's the historic role of, of RHEL in the enterprise. RHEL became the neutral runtime that the open ISV ecosystem could standardize on, and then you had choice on the ecosystem side and the hardware vendor side, and you weren't bought into that. And if you look at it today, you know, where is Linux being used? Today, Linux provides you an application runtime independent of whether you're running um, on your laptop, you're running on a, on a bare metal server, you're running on uh, virtualizations like VMware, or you're running on the, on the public cloud. It's the standard for getting this level of compatibility so my binary can work in all these options. Um, so today, and that's you know, my proof point, today probably most Linux deployments are either on VMware or on public cloud, which proves that Linux is not just infrastructure, right? It proves it's an application runtime. Because the reason people run, you know, the reason why VMware never came up with an operating system is because customers would not have wanted a vertically integrated infrastructure stack where the application runtime is owned by the people who own their infrastructure management. Very simple. Never even happened. 
And um, yeah, we'll, we'll get to back to that uh, philosophical side later. But um, so you know, the next question is what, you know, what does that mean in practical terms for, for how, we, how we do software management? Because you know, this is an evolution over time, right? We went from something very integrated to something semi-open to something open to something you know, even more flexible. Because basically what happened with virtualization is we got rid of the hardware. Now, along the same evolutionary um, track, you know, we changed how we deal with software, how we deal with the user space. Right? Early on, servers, they, you know, they were not just pets. They were exhibition docs you sent to the doc show. You had multiple admins per Unix host, and they had a lot of terminals, a lot of people working on it. You compiled stuff locally on the machine. And then, you know, because you, you wanted to map that to the binary stack, you used things like Stow or you mounted binaries on NFS. It was high maintenance. Uh, the problem is it was very fragile, right? The um, behavior of your binary depended on the build environment on the production house, host. And you were compiling stuff on the production host, which you know, kind of leads to disaster if something goes wrong. So that was too fragile. And it didn't scale in the PC environment. When Linux took over, there were too many machines. It wasn't efficient anymore to go into each machine and compile software and user local. It just couldn't be done. Right? You couldn't hire that many admins, and you know, the, the value wasn't, wasn't there. Plus, the software stack started moving faster, and it was just too hard to keep that stable and, and working. So the next thing that happened was that we got to binary reproducible packaging. You know, we introduced RPM. That's, you know, that happened, when was it? Like, took over 95, perhaps? Probably was when, you know, when Red Hat Linux 2.1 came to Germany, at least. That's where I was at the time. Uh, actually, as part of the Caldera network desktop, which is kind of funny in retrospect, because they turned themselves into SCO later. Um, but anyhow, uh, so uh, there, you know, so the, the first Linux distributions um, I, I used um, actually were just bunches of tar. And zip files. So we got to a binary model already because, you know, re at the time compiling everything uh, was just crazy. So you had tar files, but they didn't have any artifact tracking, right? And so RPM started to change that. We, we, in our, with RPM, we had a clean way to describe the build, um, build it, package the results in a way it can be distributed easily and then installed in a reproducible man manner, managing dependencies. And then actually removed again. That was important too. You could actually remove stuff without leaving artifacts behind, or you know, having like some file you touch when you install it, and then do find based on the time and all the stuff we did to to you know deal with that back in the day. Um, there, there is an important thing though that RPM did. It's kind of unintended. I I think it was unintended uh, consequence that it turns the whole system in a pure single instance, single version model. Right? RPM has no viable mechanism to let you install multiple versions of the same software stack or run uh, multiple versions easily. Um, you know, an example is, um, so you know, when we want multiple versions, we have to rename the RPM, right? You know, Python 30, right? That, that's, that's straightforward, but painful and not very flexible. Um, but the multi-instancing multi is actually more, more interesting. We have a lot of software uh, in, in, in our distribution that you can, you, you, you can install as one binary, but then you want to do multiple versions, like in the, in the web server space. You know, some content management systems. And they do, do weird things with R syncing stuff into var, lib, HTML, and stuff like that, because RPM doesn't easily let you install the code in multiple versions. Um, this was been, has been a big contention with the, the JBoss community since you know, we actually had anything to do with JBoss. We, you know, I, I used to be in product management for RHEL uh, for a long time. And we had always this fight trying to get the JBoss people to package EAP in RPMs and said, no. And we said, well, do it anyways. And then uh, they said, but no one is using it. Uh, do it anyways. It has to be done. It needs to be done. It's crazy to ship zip files. But at the end, I mean, if you look at it, why, why, why don't they want it? And why, why didn't customers use it? It's very simple. Because in the Java world, you're running multiple instances and multiple versions at the same, at the same time, always. Right? So they actually needed multiple versions of EAP on the machine at any time. And you know, RPM just sucks at that. Right? And our RPM package didn't allow that. Um, so that's you know that's an unintended consequence of what we did with RPM is that we forced everything to be a single version, single instance. 
system. Another aspect is that you know it's component level packaging, so we, it's a late binding model, um, right? We we declare all the dependencies, um, and they're like in, the, in different you know level of specific. I can't say that in English. Specificity. Um, so uh, you know, sometimes you have a, a specific version dependency. Sometimes it's just a very abstract uh, uh, package name. And uh, when you install it, that gets so that gets combined when you install it, which you know is fine. It's much better than compiling in user local. But it it uh, it still means that when you build something, you have one version of the stack. Then you move to test, and personal security errata came along, and something slightly changed in your stack. And you test that, and then you move to production, and then the expectation is that you, you know, open SSL has another like named bug, which you know isn't really good. So you have to apply that. And that means that in production, you're expecting that you can apply a security fix to your software while, you know, while it runs, restart your software, and it keeps running. Right? Um, which means that what you're running is not what you developed on and not what you tested. That's an important side effect of component level packaging. Um, you know, past RPM, you know, there were a couple of things that were added on. Kickstart, you know, spade for a satellite density engine, and you know, things like that came along, which all were about, you know, in the scale old world where you have all these machines, you don't have a few servers anymore, you have or a few big Unix hosts, you have a lot of servers. And um, you need it, you know, just to centralize how you manage that. Basically, this is still the stack we use today. Yeah, CF Engine was replaced by Puppet, that's just CF Engine on steroids. You know, has most of the same problems, if you ask me. Um, if you don't believe me, uh, go to James Shubin's talk later about uh, management. Um, and then, uh, you know, now Ansible is a different approach, with, is, is a different animal. But at the end, it's all like the same kind of core principle. We still use Kickstarter. That was probably the most. Uh, the you know, most long-lived thing that, that Red had ever introduced. And you know, I blame it for winning over SUSE, right? Um, because they didn't have something like that. They had a much nicer installer, but the automation capabilities of Kickstart, you know, which is awesome, right? You could do what you needed to do. Um, so at the end, you know, at, at large, this is still the kind of stack we use today. Um, so what does that mean for application deployment? You know, if we take this a level up, like how, you know, how am I using this stack? You know? So a core model in this is that we have a single user space um, shared between all applications. Right? That's a traditional model. We have um, an, an, an application runtime that is defined by the lifecycle of the operating system. And um, it isolates basically applications on the hardware level as a trend, you know, in, and that's kind of something we inherited from Windows um, more because in, you know in 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 Linux there's no problem to run multiple applications on the same host, but in Windows you could never really do that. So at the end, um, in the enterprise world, they always you know buy hardware for applications, and so you end up with one application per host. It's just you know. Uh, has to do with resource control and managing all of that, um, and uh, you know the, the the whole thing is like very uh, very much about long term binary stability, moving with hardware cycles, updating, uh, enabling hardware. Um, it has some issues, right? It has limited flexibility. Um, you know, the the lifecycle management on the component level gets uh, fragile. And I forgot to put a slide in here. I wanted to put in the um, the Fedora dependency chart, which you know blows your mind because you see that everything is dependent, and you know you, because we we have to make every option work, and we have to make sure that when we install something, all functions work at the same time. You know, it's basically impossible to get freaking cups out of your server install. Um, you know, which is annoying if you don't want to print right, on your server, which most servers never want to do. Um, they are, it, it gets, it, it's really hard to manage the side effects of all this, right? You change, uh, you, you add a new version of something over here, um, and then you have to test every application because you know, it might break the API over there, and then things blow up. Um, and uh, you know, it basically ties the user space, the current model ties the user space monolithically to the hardware lifecycle. Right? Um, it's not so much on the Fedora side, on the RHEL side definitely, right? our lifecycle is driven when the kernel uh, needs to be updated because we can't enable hardware anymore. And that's kind of when we do major changes in the user space stack. So it's tied together. Right? 
that's definitely a downside because you know it's uh, not necessarily how you want to drive your user space. You know that like if you consider Linux infrastructure, it totally makes sense. But if you consider the user space runtime, then this has some downsides. Um, the next thing that came along are VMs, and I'm just throwing VMs that in there, and I'll, I, I'll, I'll, I'm throwing cloud and VMs together. It's all the same thing from my point of view because essentially. It's just a workaround to the hardware tie-in that I just described. All it does is it lets you virtualize your hardware so you can basically run your operating system application-centric. Right? So when you, when you now update, you, you update your hardware, you update the hypervisor layer. Whether that is an open source stack running RHEL or REF or OpenStack, or whether that's a proprietary stack, um, is secondary from the application point of view because you, know, you don't even care because the Linux OS you're using inside the VM abstracts you from all of that. Right? So from an application-centric view, it's all the same. It gives you higher flexibility. It lets you get independent of the hardware lifecycle underneath whatever you're running, and you can focus on the application. It lets you um, also have application-specific stacks. Right? In my VM, I install what I need for the VM I'm running. I don't have to install things for other applications that might you know, be needed. So I can optimize things a bit more. I can have different versions, right? I can, with the same hardware uh, uh, setup, I can run RHEL 5, RHEL 6, RHEL 7. I don't care anymore, right? It don't, I don't get into this either or. Um, but it got, it got this rid of the hardware tie. The problem is that it's too much overhead per application, right? Um, and the, the management is too complex because it's a black box. It's essentially a new piece of hardware. You know, just they share hardware, but you can't introspect from easily into it. You know, there's a nice example. Um, we are really bad at that. Uh, VMware is much better uh, at this kind of stuff. But so when you want to when you want to do a backup of a of a uh, of a database on a Windows machine in a VMware cluster, what you do, you basically tell VMware, hey, I want to back up that VM. Um, backing up nowadays is just taking a snapshot and then managing the artifacts that are in there. So uh, you tell VMware, then VMware has an agent inside the guest that tells uh, the, the VSS service in Windows, hey, I want to back up this uh, machine. Then VSS tells the database, oh, you need to get your, you flush your, your buffers, and you know, it flushes the buffers, and it, 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 it coalesces the file system and stops everything, takes a snapshot, VMware then takes a snapshot, and then VSS tells everything to start again. Right? It's great, it works great. A, we can't do that because we don't have this level of integration. Um, B, um, B, uh, yeah, it, it's just like it, it's a lot of moving parts that have to work together. And you know, the only alternative is to put a, a backup agent in each VM, right? Which basically undermines the whole reason why I put a VM in first, because that means that now I have A to uh, share, like, a share the ownership between the application owner and the, the ops people, and B, I have to put an agent into the VM that has to be compatible with the user space runtime in the VM. Right? So I, I'm recreating shared dependencies as soon as I try to actually operate this. Um, so the lifecycle management is still too hard. Uh, another important thing, like in theory, like it's all, you know, it's all it's all cattle. But in reality, every and that's one of the reasons why, why private cloud isn't going where, where where we want it to go. Every VM you see in reality is still a pet, right? So what people do, they might deploy as a virtual image. They might deploy a virtual appliance when they update it. Update it. They log in and run yum update. At this point, right? So it's it's really just you know getting rid of the hardware dependency itself. So um, you know another philosophical view. So at this point, you know we got rid of Unix and vertical integration. We have a nice open ecosystem running on Linux. Uh, you have choice on the hardware side. Linux even manages uh, uh, quite well to give you at least source code level compatibility across different hardware architectures, which, you know, it works fairly well. It's nice, you know. Um, I, I have a nice, it, my, my home automation is all uh, uh, based on Raspberry Pis, and, you know, most of the same stuff works there. You know, it's a different distribution at this point, although I'm working on getting uh, Raspberry Pi 2 with Fedora, so even that will be the same experience. So that's really nice. Um, and, you know, we got rid of the hardware dependencies through virtualization for the uh, enterprise production. You know, and we have so a certain level of automation and and um, and efficiency. Now there's some other other trends in the market that that change behaviors right now. 
And we, we are like in a par paradigm shift that goes very deep because it's driving control outside of the traditional software and IT space. Um, you know, there are techniques and tools um, like DevOps, you know, that t t tools like containers that um, give you finer grain control over things. Um, but the biggest trend is that everything is software. Software is eating the world, right? Um, traditional business used to be about um, you know, something physical. That was what mattered. And, um, and, uh, and you know, software was the thing the IT people in the basement. Who watches uh, 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 the IT crowd? Very good. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's the IT people in the basement that do the software, and you don't have to deal with that. That's changing, right? Every business now is defined by software. Software is strategic for everything. There are more developers in the business side than in the traditional IT side or traditional software industry. If you look at you know, car manufacturing today, the hard part about car manufacturing uh, uh, is, is, is more and more getting the software right than to actually build a car, because you know, everyone knows how to build a car. That's no, not much change. It's, and, like, you know, the engines get more efficient, but you have like choice there, and you know Tesla just proved that you can from scratch just create a, you know a, a industry leading car business without but you know started by a guy who had you know he, he was a software guy right you know um, and he just had enough money to get that going and decided let's build this car and uh, get hire some people who know how to do that and let's do it. Um, if you look at the, 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 the issues that cars recently had, you know, let's say the Volkswagen uh, uh, you know, uh, um, compliance issue with, with uh, 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 the environmental limit, how they cheated, you know, they were software, right? How did they fix it? They changed the software. So, um, and you know, if cars get stopped on the highway, because someone hacked the Bluetooth thing, or like a couple of years ago, they hacked, uh, 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 I think, a Dodge, was crying by playing uh, an infected uh, uh, song through the MP3 player, right? It's all software. So software is eating the world. Really, literally means not only that you know a software is in each device, everything is software. It means that every business is doing software, and that changes how the dynamic in the software industry, because it means that business differentiation for a company, not only for software companies, and we know that for us, business differentiation is driven by all software, but now for a car manufacturer, a good part of the business differentiation is driven by their software. And that's an important change. It changes power in companies. It changes who gets to decide what technology to use, what software to use. Right now, you have in training, you had IT experts decide what stack um, to use, and they could standardize a stack for the company and say, okay, this is what we're going to use. Nowadays, that's, that's decided by marketing executives in the line of business for a car manufacturer. Right? They set the requirements. They set the pressure. Um, the things, and then, you know, that, that fuels a lot of the other changes we see. Move to cloud. That's partly in you know, CapEx versus OpEx model and uh, flexibility thing, but it's partly also because the requirements change so fast that buying hardware just doesn't, you know, it just takes long to buy hardware. So, you know, I have to go to public cloud. I need to use elasticity uh, because otherwise I can't keep up with the business demands. Um, you know, that's why I always need the current version of code. Right? I'm not going to wait for a release cycle of RHEL uh, if you know, the line of business is telling me I need this new UI integrated with this new feature and supports this new protocol and on that cloud. And um, it, it shifts from a broadcast model uh, to an on-demand model. Everything is on-demand in the current world. Um, I have to speak ta faster now because I'm running out of time. Um, I warned you about that. Uh, so, uh, you know, so, so th this leads us to kind of... A, a, a two-faced world. Um, on one hand, we have an ops-centric environment, which is traditional IT. That's not going away. People are still operating ops. Even it might be outsourced. In that case, you don't run it yourself. But someone is operating. You know, it all runs on hardware. It all, un all runs on infrastructure. Um, that's 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 a world where the Linux distribution is at home, right? We are trying to provide stability. We we provide. At the end, what Red Hat provides is an insurance policy for people who need to download and install and update binary components in place. Right? We make sure you can do that. 
and you know, our communities we basically do that without the commercial assurance, right? What we do is we give you prepackaged software stack so you don't have to compile anything to yourself. You don't have to find out how it put it together. You don't have to find out which versions work together, which versions work with your hardware. Um, and it, it's amazing what we do there. It's really great and it really works. I can install, I can update my Fedora laptop, um, you know, which is it's really a Fedora laptop even if it doesn't look like one. Um, I can update that uh, across, across Fedora releases now with not much problem other than the freaking proprietary wireless driver um, I need from fresh RPMs. And, um, you know, and it just works. I don't have major issues, even, you know, at least not, nothing that, that would block me from going to the newest Fedora version whenever it comes out. Um, there's another site now which is the app development side that's, you know, that's growing and growing and growing. That's this, you know, the business drives the industry now. And there you are in an, in an area where you download to build. These people do not install binaries, right? They compile software. They're like us, right? <laughs> they compile software and then, um, then test it and then deploy it. So that's a download to build. User case, and that's very important because right now everything we do, the whole structure of the the Fedora ecosystem is optimized to the in, in, you know, up, uh, install, download to install, and update in place model, and it's not optimized for the download to build model. And I'll um, I'll explain a bit more about that. There's another aspect; it's just a sheer complexity. This is just from module counts at org. So you know, I found it on the inter internet, so it must be true, right? A count of modules. Um, Across higher level languages, the most popular repositories. And now, so um, I don't know why it says Debian unstable down there. Uh, weird. Uh, so you know, the bottom line is, a, is the count of, of packages in Fedora Rawhide. Um, slightly above is Debian unstable. And then you know, .NET has is double the number of components right now. And then it goes up. There are 600,000 individual modules. They might all be forks of each other, and half of them, or 90% you know, of them, never used. But you know, the, the message is we cannot package all of that in, in, in a Linux distribution. It's just not possible. Just too much stuff. Right? And that's the stuff that these download to build people are pulling from. Right? They're, they're downloading .NET, Maven Central, or Ruby Gem stuff. And, um, and they, are, they have the choice of, you know, 200,000 Node.js packages. Um, and that's just, that, that putting a Linux distribution, it's a big challenge for a traditional Linux distribution, right? Um, it's just too complex, right? And um, there is no critical mass in this user space. We are just too slow to give them new versions. Even Fedora is too slow to give them new versions, even of the packages we have. That's why they go directly to upstream. And, um, I only have 10 minutes left, so I'll just uh, skip every other word now. Um, so you get the abridged version. <laughs> uh, the, uh, you know, and, and the solution to that is a containerized stack. In the containerized stack, you separate each runtime. Um, so e you separate the system runtime from the application runtimes, and each application gets its own runtime. Um, the host is deployed as an immutable image. Ideally, you don't have to do that, but it really helps. And then um, each service gets its own container, although you can have multi-service con uh, multi containers. That turns Linux immediately back into a multi-instance, multi-version environment, because you can simply um, run whatever you want in each container. Right? They don't affect each other. You completely get rid of interdependencies. The, the dependency chart basically gets reduced to my container's dependency chart, and the next container can do the, something, something else. Um, it gives me maximum flexibility. It also lets me delegate at the container level because I don't have, like in VMs, one of the problems is that it's still the full operating system, including the system runtime, including the hardware uh, piece, the networking stack. I don't have that in a container, so I can easily give the application people control over the container, still contain, control it from the outside, and they don't get, um, you know, they don't get to break out of that. And I can still introspect it, right? I don't need to do these things that I described about backups in VMware because uh, I, it's not a black box. The host or even a privileged container can inspect into other containers. I can just see it. We'll publish the slides, so don't worry about that. Um, so, uh, you know, and the use cases for containers are 
uh, there are basically three, three levels of use case. And like the first one will make some heads explode, and I think I'll get a call afterwards from, uh, from Brent Baudu, who just uh, did a blog telling you not to do this. But um, it's, uh, it's a pet container. And um, th this is the first thing you should try if you're doing containers. I do that on my laptop all the time. I just instantiate a, a, Docker, image, a Docker base image uh, or the RHEL tools image or you know, a Fedora image, and then I basically treat that like a VM. That's perfect if you want to try something out, you want to install random NPM stuff, or you want to, you know, I, I, I'm working on a little, um, for my basement, I'm working on a little uh, PXE boot server because I cannot upload, you know, it, it's some like Java, ILO, 32-bit, weirdness. So I need a PXE server, and I don't have a machine. I don't want to install all of that on my host because then I have to find all the pieces. Even in you know, even it's got much better with DNF, but still, it's you know, it's just easier to put in a container. I do whatever I want. I compile some shit in there. If I don't need it anymore, I just remove the container. It's done, right? So I'm basically partitioning my laptop already into uh, multiple runtimes this way just for convenience to try out things and do things without having to um, deal with it in you know, polluting my, my, my core system. And it's going to get more and more. There are things I can just deploy. You know, I wanted to try out, um, uh, I want to try out Metamost and GitLab. They give you a Docker container with the integrated solution, so it's just run it and you got it, right? Don't deal with anything else if it's a trusted source. Of course, you know, if you do that from the wrong source and you just uh, uh, introduced a, a botnet in your, uh, in your environment. But um, no, seriously, uh, it, it's a valid use case to run to run a pet container. And if you're moving from, a, from an existing application, you know, a lot of people say like containers are mode, mode two and then we have this mode one application. That's all, it's a continuum. And you can make uh, basically every mode one application work in a container. Um, the next thing is multi-service containers. It's another thing that makes some heads explode, right? Because containers are microservices. Not true. Uh, Denwatch did a lot of work to get, uh, uh, get systemd working in containers. So just if you need an existing application, a container, just uh, you know, make, make CMD has been in it, um, and then you have systemd running in your container. Um, you might, depending which version of Docker you're using, you might need to give it some privilege. In the uh, newest version, you don't need to do that. And then you can just install your software like you used to, and it just works, right? It just starts the unit files, and it just, it just works. And uh, you just need to do the mappings on the outside, which is not harder than dealing with firewalls or anything else. And then you go to multi-container applications, which is really where you need to start dealing with Kubernetes because that lets you orchestrate them. Um, the, the, the real container applications that looks like this, right? It's, everything is a cluster. We are always in a scale-out world. Um, the, the host is immutable. And um, you, you, an application is basically an, uh, an orchestrated set of containers. I have Kubernetes as my cluster manager. I have the definition of my application is this set of containers. And then it starts them. Um, and uh, it's, it's always multi-tenant and uh, multi-service. Taking a step back to the philosophical view, you know, if we compare that to my, one of my first slides where I talked about the, you know, the role of RPM when we came from user local compile into you know, something that scales. Um, Docker slash OCI, the, the container format we are standardizing on, um, basically has the same function that RPM had in this transition. We are at a point where you know, the, because of the complexity of the stacks, um, Installing things in production with, on the component level, resolving component level dependencies, is so complex and fragile, it's almost equivalent to the problem we had uh, 20, 15, 20 years ago. I'm not really that old. Yeah. Uh, 15, 20 years ago with uh, user local compiles. Because the, if, especially, you know, one, the next thing we have to do is, uh, is weak dependencies because, you know, we have to get rid of that CAPS server in our server installs, so we need weak dependencies. Once you have weak dependencies, the, the, installed, the installed stack, the late binding stack that gets bound when you install it, not when you build it, is going to be so dependent on parameters you know, not known when you build it 
that um, it's going to be too complex to deal. When you're outside of the RPM space, that's already the case. It's too complex to deal with. So the only way to deal with that is by doing aggregate packaging. You know, early on, when you build it, when you're in the download to build mode, when you're an application developer in enterprise, you build the artifact, and then you move the same artifacts to build test production, automate that process, and you use the, con the aggregate packager as um, you know, to manage the, the installed artifacts. Um, so we go, go to an early binding model. Interestingly, there's a precedence for this. And when I, I, years ago, I, I, was, uh, I was in the field organization in Europe for Red Hat. And a big thing, big thing for us back then was to install Oracle for customers in like rack clusters. And we, you never wanted to run the Oracle Java installer on a production system because it was kind of, you know, it was very fragile, it would not always work, it would be dependent, it wouldn't take care of dependency because it wasn't an RPM, right? So what we did is actually did, one, did it on one machine, then built a binary RPM of the resulting installation, distributed that through satellite. Um, so basically we moved to aggregate packaging to deal with the fragility of this Java-driven installer and, and fragile software stacks that didn't do the dependency management. Um, so this is basically what Docker, Docker does very conveniently. It lets us package a stack it's the next logical step. It doesn't invalidate RPM because it's a level above it, right? But it moves the consumption of the RPM dependency resolution in, the, in a, in a pre-stage for the application developer. Not for the system people, or maybe, but that's a different discussion. Um, and then you use that to distribute that. And it makes you, it allows you in a clean way to add other uh, packaging artifacts on top of that. Um, one thing that Docker doesn't do, it, it only gives you container level packaging. Um, there's another thing I'd like you, you know, to, to take a look at, which is the Atomic app or you know, the upstream uh, project called Nulecule. Um, and I think we have some talks about that. Uh, so this is, this is basically the next step where you, um, where you go from packaging individual containers. Right? I, I described an application as always consisting out of multiple containers and being orchestrated you know, through Kubernetes. Neither Kubernetes nor Docker give you a transport format for this higher level construct. You know, it's basically when you want to, you know, today I can do a yum, yum install IPA, free IPA, and then a, a IPA server install, and I end up with a ready to run, orchestrated, parameterized instance of IPA. Um, when I want to do that in containers, I'm back to copying templates around, an, you know, so Vim becomes my, uh, my IPA server. I, <coughs> IPA server install, which isn't really great because it's a functional regression. That's what Atomic App solves. It gives you a way to define, package the aggregate metadata and uh, define a way how to uh, parameterize that on deployment. Um, that all, like putting it all together, um, so this is uh, kind of the in enterprise stack. Um, it's a bit, a, jump, but I warned you about that, um, that there will be some conceptual jumps in my presentation. So if you put this all together, you know, we basically operate on three layers. It's the infrastructure, the application runtime, um, and lifecycle management and application content. Mapping that to, to what we do, right? We have a bunch of different uh, cloud options. We have uh, Atomic Enterprise as the runtime, OpenShift as the lifecycle management, and our frameworks on top. That's a logical view, and I'm out of time. So I'll just skip to the uh, last slide. To close the cycle, it's, uh, it's only a slight logical. So if we look at what's happening in public cloud right now, we are seeing actually a move back to uh, vertically integrated Unix stacks. Right? Um, every cloud vendor and every private, private, private cloud offering is trying to do vertical integration up to the pass level. Right? If you're going to Amazon, they're trying to get you to use all their services. And they tell you, hey, don't worry, it's just database. You know, don't worry which one it is. Our role in this model is the same role we had when we broke the vertically integrated Unix stack. We are breaking the vertically integrated cloud stack, and we're giving people alternatives and the ability to define the applications independent of the vertically integrated stacks, gives them an open ecosystem to choose from, and then run that application without, without the application actually knowing the, the specifics of the underlying stack across all these options. That's uh, the vision where we're going with the operating system here. That's it. Thank you. And that's a logo I'm proposing. 
and I'll be around for questions. And I apologize for going over.